In this segment, and the following too, we'll look at how the Standard I.O. Library, abbreviated Standard I.O., works under the hood, and how all its functions ultimately call binary file I.O. calls to do the real I.O. We'll walk through an example implementation of Standard I.O.H and the Standard I.O.C file that goes with it. Binary system calls are the true I.O. functions supplied by the operating system, but they have significant drawbacks. First and foremost, they don't do any translation to and from textual numbers and internal binary representation. If a user types 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or if a file contains that text, then a read call will return six ASCII codes, not the binary integer value 123,456. Also, it's difficult to use binary calls for formatted text data in general. There's no way, for instance, to tell read to read only up to the end of the current line of input. And system I.O. calls can be very slow, especially if they're working with a disk file. Finding and reading or writing information on disk requires several milliseconds, which is enough time for a typical CPU to perform several million machine language instructions. So it makes sense to read and write files in large chunks, perhaps several k bytes at a time, rather than just a few bytes at a time. The standard I.O. library, again generally abbreviated STDIO or standard I.O., fixes these problems. It provides functions, like printf and scanf, that do text to binary translations, and it buffers I.O., doing reads and writes in large blocks. Now the real standard I.O. library is implemented in the standard I.O.H and standard I.O.C file pair. You routinely pound include standard I.O.H, but you rarely see standard I.O.C since it's standard I.O.O object file, along with certain other standard libraries, like those for malloc and free, is automatically linked in by the compiler. To explain how standard I.O. works internally, we'll walk through an example implementation of it that works very much like the real one, though with less cumbersome detail and without providing the entire library of functions. Our examples functions and macros are named identically to the standard I.O. equivalents, but capitalized and with an alt prefix. For instance, we have uh, alt put C here. So they don't clash with the real ones when we compile the example. Now the core type in the standard I.O. library is file, mimicked by our alt file type on lines uh, 7 through 13 of alt standard I.O. Dot H. As you know from using standard I.O., any open file is represented by a pointer to a capitalized F-I-L-E. Our alt file has the same type of contents as file in the standard I.O. library. Like file, it manages an open file descriptor, which is held in its FD field. It also holds a buffer of data for the file. Buffered reading requires fetching data in a large block, for instance maybe 1K, from the file, and then holding on to that data until scanf, getc, or similar calls need it. By serving many scanf, getc, or other calls with the same large read operation, we cut down on highly expensive disk fetches. And buffered writing works the other way. It gathers output from printf or putc or, or similar calls into a buffer until a large block of data has been accumulated and then writes all the accumulated data in one write call. Now in either case we need three critical pieces of data. The buffer, a pointer to the next unused location within the buffer as we consume it for reading or fill it for writing, and the buffer size, which as we'll see is sometimes not the full length of the buffer. Now these are held in alt files, buffer, next, and buff size fields, respectively. The final alt file field, flags, is a flag integer with bits for various file states, such as whether the file is open for reading or for writing, uh, or has reached EOF. And we'll be oring those into that uh, flags int. Now, you might think that we'd malloc alt file structs as needed to represent files, but like the real standard I.O., 
Our example library declares a single global array, alt files, on line 15 here. And this contains all alt file structs that will ever exist in the program. Since we're only allowed a fixed number of open files at a time anyway, it makes sense to do this. Also, as we'll see when we look at the alt files array definition in altstudio.c, array initialization syntax lets us easily initialize the first three alt file structs to work with file descriptors 0, 1, and 2 that are automatically open when the program starts, per earlier lectures. Now, most of the rest of altstudio.h comprises prototypes for the standard I.O. functions for which we'll provide alternate versions, plus a few macros we'll look at later. Let's start with the most fundamental operations, alt getsy, alt putsy, and alt f flush. Now, the code for these three functions in altstudio.c illustrates the basics of standard I.O. buffering. All of them assume an already open alt file struct to work with. We'll look at opening alt files in a bit. Now, function alt putc, which is the analog of standard I.O.'s putc, writes a care to an alt file. It assumes that there's at least one open space in buffer. Line 17 puts the care into the next open space, advancing next. Lines 18 through 19 check to see if the buffer is full, if next is pointing past the end of the usable uh, buffer space. And if so, they call alt f flush to clear the buffer and write it out. And there'll be more on Alt F flush in a moment. Alt get C, the analog of standard IO's get C, gets the next character from an alt file that is open for reading and returns it as an int. On lines 23 through 24, it checks first to see if the buffer is empty and calls Alt F flush to fill it back up, if so. Then, having ensured full buffer if possible, it returns either EOF if the file at EOF flag is set, which means we've hit the end of file, or it returns the next care in the buffer and advances next. Now, obviously, Alt F flush, which is the analog of standard AO's F flush, is a critical function. It's the only one that actually reads or writes data. It starts with an error check on lines 32 through 33, returning EOF as the standard IOF flush does if the alt file is not opened or if the file has reached EOF. Then lines 35 through 39 handle the read case reading in a new buffer of data from FD into buffer, attempting to read up to buff size bytes and recording the actual number read in res. Question 1. Lines 37 through 38, they check for res being 0. What does that signify? Coming back from pause, it's a, just a reality check on your um, viewing of earlier lectures. Recall from prior lecture that read returns 0 when we've reached EOF. And if we have, then line 38 ORs file at EOF into flags. In either event, res becomes the new buffer size. In general, buff size may be less than the total size of the buffer array if there are fewer useful bytes in buffer, in particular if we weren't able to read an entire buffer is full. Now line 42 handles the write case, writing out all bytes between the start of the buffer and next. And in both the read and write cases, line 44 resets next to the start of the buffer and returns 0 
the entire function, I'm sorry, returns zero uh, if all is well, or EOF if there was a read or write error, a return value of negative from the calls, just like the real F flush does. Same return logic. So in the next segment, we'll look at opening and closing files and at some of the macros.